From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Uh, Dollar? There's Alder here. There must be something the matter with the house phone. I thought I rang a different room. Doris Cole's room, Mr. Alder? Well, yes. That's what you got. Now, uh, see here, Dollar, you're not questioning that woman, badgering her. We were simply discussing two headaches and the value of aspirin. Want to speak to her? I just wanted to be sure everything was all right. Both of you running out of the nightclub with headaches like that. Oh, everything's fine. I'd like to speak to you, though. Sorry, it's late. I have a long day tomorrow. I'm afraid it's important. Good night, Dollar. Are you thinking of arresting me, Mr. Dollar? I'm not a policeman, Miss Cole. You act like one. Answering my phone, sneaking into my room while I'm gone. That evens the score, then. You had a quick look through mine earlier in the day. Mr. Dollar. Just what were you looking for, Miss Cole? Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Caracas, Venezuela, to the Home Office Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Alder Matter. Expense account continued. Back in my own room after saying goodnight to a sullen Doris Cole, I didn't feel the slightest qualms about having invaded her room and lying about the reason for it. Why should I? The people in the Alder house didn't seem too concerned with the truth. In fact, the whole case seemed to be a question of lie or say nothing. Consider, Billy Alder had been shot at, indicating he had a good reason to change beneficiaries five times in a month. And still, he was the original say-nothing fella. Keep me alive was all I could get out of him. His wife had lied, his daughter had lied, and Doris Cole, an old friend of the family, had just proved to be a walking lie. The passport I'd found in her room had her photograph, all right, but it said she was Dora Jansen. An unsigned letter in the same drawer had stated simply that the Caribbean star would dock tomorrow. I got into bed, and an odd thought hit me. If the Caribbean star didn't dock, would the steamship company have joined the Liars Club, too? Expense account item seven, ten cents. One newspaper bought on the La Guiara docks early next morning. My Spanish is pretty nothing, but I could read the important thing, that the Caribbean star was due at noon. With time to kill, I drove into Billy Alder's office in Caracas. He hit the ceiling when I told him about Doris Cole's passport. I was suddenly glad I'd mentioned nothing about the letter. Dollar, how dare you search the room of a guest in my house? How dare you? Just returning a courtesy. What? Mine was searched thoroughly. Well, that still isn't any reason for your behavior. Oh, one-way ethics, Mr. Alder? I've told you repeatedly, Dollar. There's only one reason I want you here. I know. Keep you alive. But how? With handcuffs on... Now, suppose I told you to find some oil, then refused to let you dig any holes in the ground. You'd begin to smell a rat, wouldn't you? What are you talking about? Just about everything in this cell. Look, I have a very busy... Who is Dora Jansen, Mr. Alder? And why does she call herself Doris Cole? You're making too much of nothing, Dollar. It isn't a crime to use another name. That depends on the reason, doesn't it? Yeah, she's... An old friend. Oh, who isn't? Dollar, I... Aren't you tired of that tune? For a man who's afraid for his life, you've got more old friends than anyone I ever knew. Also, I haven't noticed anything particularly friendly between you. Yeah, she's, she's not a well woman, Dollar. Uh, I don't want you bothering You don't want me bothering anyone. Exactly. Not even the one who fired that shot at you. So I can't help getting an impression that you have a pretty good idea of who it might have been. I told you I was busy, Dollar. Yeah, but it's what you haven't told me I keep thinking about. Um, uh, Dollar. What? Did, uh, did you find anything else in that room... Beside the passport? Why, Mr. Alder, what's happened to your sense of ethics? There was still plenty of time before the Caribbean star would be docking, and Billy Alder's reaction had dictated my next move. The cable office in Laguiara suddenly seemed like a very important place to visit. There were too many silent mouths in Caracas, and I needed one that had something to say. Ah, okay, miss. You can take this now. Si, sí, senor. How you like this to go? Don't spare the horses. Okay. Uh, cable, rush. Ah, see. Si. Victor Kelly, world... Yeah, I know my lousy handwriting here. 
To Victor Kelly, Worldwide Mutual, Hartford, Connecticut, USA. See? Want all possible information, Dora Jansen, a.k.a. Doris Cole, U.S. Passport, 19B67943-11, signed dollar. And your address for the answer? Uh, I'll pick it up here. As you wish. And lady, please... I know, senor. Don't spare the horses. It was still early when I reached the waterfront where the Caribbean Star would soon be docking. There wasn't much point in watching the incoming passengers. I didn't even know who I was looking for. So I found a spot at the pier entrance where I could concentrate on those meeting the passengers. Here I made a grudging concession to all movie detectives. Item seven, another 10 cents, another newspaper to hide behind. And you know something? It works fine. Doris Cole, or according to that passport, Dora Jansen, was nervous, excited. And it was no trouble to stay close behind her as she met a passenger, a short, nondescript man in his late 50s. When they jumped into a cab and hurried away from the pier, they were closely followed by a man clutching an unread newspaper, me. The trip was a short one, about six or seven blocks away. The cab in front pulled up at a cheap hotel on the waterfront. I circled the block once, got rid of my cab, and wandered into the dismal lobby. The fat, sleepy clerk made a concession. He opened one eye. See, si, you look for something. Yeah, that uh, gentleman who just came in, I, uh, I had an appointment with him. Oh, darn it, I, I must have left the slip of paper with his name on it in my hotel. I can't find it. Uh, it's too bad. You know, the gentleman who just went up to room... Uh, room uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want me to say the number now, huh? <laughs> When you think I ever been to a movie? Oh, no, really. You can save me a lot of embarrassment. You've got it right there on the register. See? Si. Mind if I have a look? I mind. Look, friend. When was the last time you got anything for free, friend? Oh, why didn't you say so? I was trying not to offend you. Here. Here, let me see. You play blackjack, senor? How you call the uh, uh, 21? Yeah, why? Like they say, hit me again. Oh, you're rubbing it in. See? Si. You want to do business or no? Item nine, ten bucks. Market schmear, schmooze, or just plain graft. He pointed an oversized forefinger at a name on the ledger, lost interest in me, went back to sleep. Arthur Singer, it said, room eight. I went up the stairway. A few seconds later, I moved as quietly as I could down the grimy second floor hallway, stopped at the door at number eight. At first, I heard nothing. Then after a long minute, the voices began, angrily, as though resuming an old know. argument. I don't know. Then let me handle it. No, no, but what about him? Suppose he What knows. does he does? You want it all to go for nothing? Now you listen to me. I know what I'm doing. Five minutes later, I was back in the cable office getting a second message off to Vic Kelly in Hartford. It was a request for anything he could possibly dig up on Arthur Singer. I didn't hope for too much because it would probably turn out to be an uh, alias, but it was an angle I couldn't afford to overlook. You're not back for answers so soon, senor. Oh, no, I just want you to get this one off. Same fella. And same way, no spare the horses? That's it. And thanks. It's nada. Oh, senor, I want to ask you something. Shoot. Your business partner, did I do something to displease him? He seemed so angry. My who seemed so what? Well, he was so nice at first, but after he read the message... Wait a hold everything. First of all, I have no business partner. Oh, then I make terrible mistakes. Oh, just tell me what happened. Well, this man, he come in less than a minute after you leave, was very nice. Yeah. Said he was your business partner, that he'd just leave you. You were worried because you forgot whether you say something in the message you just sent. Then you ask him to check it for you. Uh -huh. He seemed to know what he was talking. So you showed it to him. Then? That is when he got so angry. He just put it down and leave. What did he look like? A little less tall than you, and he have gray hair. Eyeglasses? See, si, eyeglasses. Gray suit? See, si, senor. Gray suit, you know him? I'm beginning to wonder if anyone really does. I am so sorry for my mistake, senor. Oh, forget it. It wasn't your fault. Uh, just send that second message. See, si, senor. About the answers. Send them to me at William Alder's house as soon as you get them. Maybe we'll read them together. Billy Alder was my new business partner. Alder, the original close-mouthed fellow. But it looked like there was nothing wrong with his brain or his eyesight. Then suddenly I didn't mind that he'd read my message to Vic Kelly, because a frightened man usually reacts at the extreme ends of the scale. He'd been at the let's-do-nothing end. Maybe he'd now go the other way. 
There was one more step I could make on the waterfront, so I made it. My credentials presented at the steamship offices got me a look at the passenger list of the Caribbean Star. The name Arthur Singer wasn't on it. I started down the small waterfront street to where my car was parked. My mind was full of Billy Alder and the pieces of this crazy puzzle, tugging one way, pulling another. Trying to make sense out of it somehow, I used some sort of slide rule where logic could be a solid base. And no matter how I twisted it, I knew one thing. It just wouldn't work. I didn't have enough yet to make it work. I was just reaching for the door handle when I saw his reflection in the car window. The man who'd sneaked up behind me, blackjack raised high in the air. The blackjack was just insurance. He was tough enough without it. I finally worked up to the side of the car, managed to half Nelson, and let the car door workers my blackjack. Five seconds later, an officer came rushing up, and five minutes later, I sat in the office of Jefe Velasquez, chief of police. You feeling all right now, amigo? Yeah, yeah, sure. What did you get out of that blackjack artist? Just what I expected. Still won't say who hired him, huh? You have to understand this kind of fellow, amigo. I do, huh? What I mean, he's uh, uh, assassino pequeño, you, you know? Cheap hood, monster. Uh, see, si, see. Si. For extra two bolivar, maybe three, he would blackjack his mother. He claims he does not know who hired him, that he is to get his money in a letter. <laughs> that one I was spats. Okay. I say he's lying. Of course, but he will stick to the story because he knows he will get the same sentence whether he tells or he does not. A cheap hood won't usually cover for somebody else. This guy does, amigo. Otherwise, he would never be hired again. I'd, uh, I'd give a lot for a few minutes alone with him, Jefe. Sorry, Juanito, but I like my job. Yeah, just wishful thinking. <laughs> not hard to understand. Well... You are leaving? Not getting anywhere sitting here. Are uh, you sure you haven't got business somewhere else, sir? Uh, I got an awfully big end to talk to that thug. You know, I got a hunch. Forget it, amigo. It's like I say. If you ask him on a Monday what is the day, he must tell you Tuesday. You could beat him to death, he will still say Tuesday. Is the way they think. A fair favor. If I can. Suppose I don't prefer charges. Would you put a tail on him when he leaves? Johnny. Look, look. I know it's a million to one against the hood doing a rough up without the money in hand, but... If he hasn't collected you... Come, amigo, like you say, a million to one. I know I'm grabbing at straws, but just in case, if I... Come on, huh? Okay. Good, thanks. Hey, where do you go? Back to the cable office. Oh? Yeah. And if a man in Hartford has nothing to say, I've got a permanent seat behind the eight ball. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a puzzle never fits itself together. You've got to snoop, pry, and juggle the pieces. And sometimes people get killed that way. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Tony Barrett. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Mm -hmm.